Right, I forgot I logged in as you yesterday. I'm sorry about that. I gotta log, I'll log out and log back in. That's fine. No, that's fine. Oh. I'll call back in in a second. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and let everyone into the room and then we'll get started. Okay. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here today. We are gonna let everyone get situated in our Zoom room. It takes a minute or two to connect. So uh, we'll give everyone just a few moments before we get started in today's conversation. So welcome everyone, if you're just joining us, my name is Jennifer Thompson and I am the Executive Director of NASW New Jersey and in Delaware. And we are gonna let everyone get situated in the room before we get started, so just give us a minute or two. We have close to 500 people registered for today's conversation. I know, so I see some eyeballs going, wow, that's a lot of people. Uh, so uh, it sometimes takes me just a minute to get connected into the Zoom room. We wanna make sure people uh, are able to hear the entire conversation. All right, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. We have some people who will be joining us and we'll let them in as the conversation unfolds, um, but I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So again, welcome everyone. My name is Jennifer Thompson. I'm the Executive Director of NASW New Jersey and Delaware, and we're so incredibly grateful that you're uh, joining us here today for this important conversation. Let's talk about whiteness, understanding racial identity, privilege, and fragility. And we are incredibly honored that uh, we have Kristen Miller, a licensed clinical social worker and uh, educator um, and therapist as well to lead us in this conversation today. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Kristen, in just a moment, but a few housekeeping items. We really love for these to be community conversations, so an opportunity for us to engage and to ask questions, and sometimes that can be a little tricky on Zoom. Um, but there are a couple of ways that you can interact today. First is our chat box, so we certainly encourage you to chat there, share feedback, um, thoughts, questions, just interact with one another. There's a little an emoji, a Zoom emoji that I've just learned how to use, um, but you can certainly applaud, uh, use the emoji to applaud if you if something resonates with you. And if you'd like to come online, we'd love to hear from you as well. So if you just wanna raise your hand, um, I will bring you online and you can go live and ask questions as well. Um, so welcome to everyone joining us for today's conversation and welcome Kristen. Thank you so much for joining us and for leading us in this, this dialogue today. Thank you so much. Um, so first of all, I am really excited to be here. Um, I'm really excited about the number of people who are taking time out of their really busy schedules to join this really important conversation. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about myself, um, as Jen said, I am a licensed clinical social worker. Um, I have a group therapy practice mosaic counseling and consulting. Um, and part of that is, um, doing a lot of training workshops. And so one of my passions really is talking about racism and race-based trauma. Um, and I actually teach a trauma class at Seton Hall as well. So educating up and coming social workers. Um, so I think where I wanted to start was talking a little, little bit about my own racial identity development journey. Um, I think as white people, right, we're often socialized not to really notice or think about race. So if you may not be familiar with the concept of white racial identity development, um, there is a phenomenal researcher, Dr. Janet Helms, who has done uh, a lot of work related to white racial identity development. And so wherever you may be in your process, one of my goals today is for you to just be able to locate where you may be in your racial identity development journey. So the first phase of that is called contact. And so for white people, that means there's this obliviousness about race and racial issues. 
Um, and that's the space where people start out where they're really colorblind. And so you're not recognizing race. And so I grew up in Morristown, New Jersey, which is a very diverse town, but as with many communities in the United States, it's quite segregated. And so I went to Catholic elementary and high schools. So I grew up really not giving much thought at all to any issues related to race. And then I transitioned to college where I participated in a social justice residential college. So it was a really amazing experience where we were all put together in a dorm and we would take a social justice seminar. We would have a movie night and it was really set up for having ongoing conversations outside of the classroom. And so I, I would say then I started to have a bit of understanding. Um, and then after college, I transitioned to uh, where most of my career took place, which is at the Challenge Program, a partial hospitalization program for children and adolescents in Newark, New Jersey. And so, I recognize that the experience that I had there is very unique in that the director of the program really made it a priority to talk about issues related to race. And so that was really woven into the fabric of the program where we would talk about issues related to race at our multidisciplinary meetings. Those conversations would continue at lunch and spending time in the office after work. Um, and so it was really there that I transitioned into the second phase of white racial identity development, which I think Dr. Holmes accurately called disintegration. And so I think that's a process that many white people are going through right now right, where all these things that we thought were true are not true. And we're really starting to become aware of the realities of racism and its pervasive and systemic nature in our country, right? And that's really what this country was built on. Um, and so as people enter that stage of racial identity development, there's often an increase in discomfort and in guilt and in shame as white people are really starting to recognize how pervasive racism is and the privileges that we have as white people. And so in my own journey, it literally felt like I was disintegrating. Um, I would go home after work and cry multiple days a week. Um, and I had to do a lot of self-reflection, a lot of education. And so in doing that, I had an awesome mentor, one of my favorite supervisors, who was a Black woman. And she was really the person who pushed me into doing the teaching and training aspects. So we had racial identity development um, seminars for the psychology interns. And so she had said she wanted me to do a six-week seminar. And I didn't really think that I was qualified to do that. And, you know, she said, while there are some of the white interns who are open to hearing from anybody, there are going to be some white people that will dismiss what I have to say as a black woman, right? And we see this a lot in media, right? Um, and in day-to-day -day conversations where when a person of color brings up something related to race, right? It's often, why do you have to make everything about race? right? I don't see any color. We're all part of the human race, right? Or perceiving a person of color who's passionately talking about their experiences with racism, right? They can be perceived as being angry. Um, so her pushing me to do this is really what started my passion for really teaching and training related to, to racism and race-based trauma. Thank you so, so much. I think you're a little bit paused and I, oh, good. Now we're back. There's a okay. little bit of glitch. <laughs> okay. So 
in terms of white racial identity development, right, the goal is to really get to the end phase, which is called autonomy, right? And that's really reaching a place where you really seek out and value diversity. You are committed to being anti-racist, right? And speaking up against racism as well as this process of ongoing learning. Because I think one of the things that we want to think about is the fact that we are all continuing to learn all the time. So even people who may can be considered expert in an area, right? There's this constant self-reflection that really does need to be ongoing. And so um, related to white racial identity development, if you are a white person who is on this call, I would really encourage you to just, again, locate where you are in your journey with the goal of, you know, it's never helpful to try to cause people to feel shame or guilt about where they are or the thoughts that they have up until today, right? But the goal in having this conversation is to really think about, okay, so in order to get to that next phase, what might I need to do, right? What learning do I need to do? What self-reflection do I need to do with the goal of continuing to evolve in your own racial identity development journey? And do you want me to continue talking about other? Okay, I can just continue. Okay. Yep, so, go right ahead. Okay. So, um, the, one of the other concepts that we wanted to talk about today, and, and we welcome questions and comments, so feel free to do that, um, is the concept of white privilege, right? So, white privilege is often a topic that causes white people to become extremely uncomfortable, right? So there are many white people who don't feel like they're privileged, right? So I think it's really important to understand white privilege does not mean that life is not hard for white people, right? It, at any point, we all have different struggles that we're dealing with, but what it does mean is that no matter what a white person may be struggling with, right, that there are specific struggles related to being a person of color in this country that we don't have to struggle with, right? And for anybody interested in doing some reading on white privilege, um, the person who really originated this concept is Peggy McIntosh. And this is one of the resources listed on NASW New Jersey's website, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. And so her belief is that white people really are socialized not to think about or talk about race and therefore not to recognize the inherent privilege that we have. And so she wrote an article, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack, and how she even came to this realization was thinking about how as a woman, she was recognizing there were privileges that she didn't have that men had. And so as a white person, she was thinking there were probably privileges that she had that people of color didn't have. And so it's things as simple as, right, if we think about the issue of police brutality, right, part of white privilege is for me, if I'm driving on the highway and I get pulled over by a police officer, right, my biggest worry might be that I'm going to get a ticket right? But that's a privilege because for a person of color, right, it would make sense for them to literally have a fear that they might not make it out of that interaction alive, right? And so things like going shopping, right, which I'm not doing too much of in the pandemic, but if I go to the store, right, I don't ever have to think about or worry about being followed, Right. If I achieve so with the challenge program, I had um, you know worked there for some time and eventually became the supervisor of the program. I didn't ever have to worry: Are people going to think that I got this position just because I'm a person of color? Right. The ways that people may misconstrue affirmative action. Right. There are many white people that see affirmative action as reverse racism. Right. And as social workers, we know that that doesn't exist. Um, but this idea that 
for people of color, right, there is sometimes this assumption on the part of white people that they're just fulfilling a quota, right, when affirmative action is really designed to mitigate the impact of years of systemic racism, but it also is giving qualified people of color priority, right? So it's not just, just based on somebody's race, they're gonna get a position that they're unqualified for. That's not going to happen. Um, and so being able to recognize and talk about white privilege is really essential to being anti-racist, right? And, and oftentimes it's a very unnerving process because how could we not feel guilt and shame at recognizing that we have these privileges simply based on appearance, right? Um, and so being able to engage and acknowledge that is really, is really an important place to start in terms of doing, doing our own work. Um, and then the final concept that we wanted to make sure we talked about is the concept of white fragility, right? And in some ways that's tied to white privilege. So this idea that white people can often become very fragile and defensive in conversations related to race, right? So if a person of color or even another white person brings up any issue related to being white, right, or any issues around race at all, that oftentimes white people become very defensive, they become uncomfortable, um, they can become agitated and angry, they can also have the experience of feeling attacked, right, when oftentimes that's not really what's happening. Um, and then there might be things people are, might have heard of the term white tears, right? So a white, per, a white woman especially may start crying, white people may shut down and refuse to participate in a conversation. Um, they may deny their individual racism, right? Or try to explain away or defend something that they said, or there can be a focus on intention. Right, so a person of color might say, hey, I was really offended by that comment that you made. And oftentimes a white person's first response is, well, that's not what I meant, right? And so white fragility makes sense when we think about the fact that white people really are socialized not to talk about or think about race, right? So the idea that right, a lot of times if children, and I'm seeing this slowly shift now, if a child makes a comment about race, parents' reaction is often this horror, right? Like, oh my gosh, don't talk about that, right? You, you can't talk about that. So we're socialized to think it's bad to talk about it. It's bad to notice difference. But in doing that, ultimately what we're doing is we're literally deleting the experience of people of color, right? Because as social workers, we know race is a social construct, right? It's not biological. But just because it isn't true doesn't mean that it's not real, right? It has real impact on people's lives, people's choices, people's opportunities and options. And so it's really important for white people to do the work of building those muscles, right? If I've never had to talk about and think about race, why would I think I would be good at it, right? So in terms of combating white fragility, it really is about committing to the process, right? And acknowledging that if you grew up in this country, and this is really for all people, if any person on this call, if you grew up here, we've all internalized racist ideas, right? White people and people of color. And so it's really important to be able to examine it. And so I, I share a story related to my family in what I think is the powerful illustration of the pervasiveness of what we all internalize on a daily basis and we're not even aware of what we're internalizing. 
So my uncle through marriage was a black man. And every year we would go and we would visit my aunt and uncle in California. And so the background on my uncle is important to this story. So he was a principal in the LA school system, which is where he met my aunt. Um, they lived in a nice condo by the beach in Marina Del Rey. Um, they had matching Mercedes. And my uncle had been previously married and quite significantly, he had gotten full custody of his two children, right? So that's almost unheard of. Usually if there's a divorce, women have primary custody. And so he was raising his two sons by himself when he met my aunt. Um, and so he was really this amazing man. And when one of my family members was about nine years old, he asked my father, is Uncle Lionel a drug dealer? And I think that this story is important for, for two reasons. Number one, right, it speaks to how pervasive systemic racism is, that despite our love for this uncle, right, despite the fact that none of the evidence would say that this is what was happening. There weren't people coming in and out of their home, right? There weren't large sums of money. There was never drug paraphernalia. So in the absence of all of that, right, that these ideas had still been internalized, right? That the belief was for a black male to have achieved this level of success, he must be doing something criminal. Right. And that's that's one of the microaggressions that many people of color deal with on a daily basis. Right. That assumption of criminal status. And so I think the other important point related to this story is we get to choose how we respond to that question. So when I do workshops, there are always a couple of white people that when I share this story, they gasp right? Like, oh my gosh, that is horrible. I can't believe, you know, he would say that. But I think a more helpful question, right? And, and I call it um, compassionate curiosity, right? That we want to take this perspective of being curious. So instead of just labeling it as racist and saying, you shouldn't say things like that, don't ask that question, right? It's much more helpful to think about, so despite all the things that were true, right? And despite there being no evidence of this, how was this idea internalized? Where did he get this idea? Because it's only in actively acknowledging that these ideas are present that we have the chance to challenge it right? We can't address problems that we're not willing to talk about. And so I think even in terms of our own self-reflection, right? A lot of white people don't want to ask questions or don't want to say things because they don't want to appear racist, right? And that level of silence is also part of white privilege, right? That's a privilege that if I don't really ever want to talk about issues around race, I can choose not to, right? But that idea that silence is complicity. So part of the self-reflection is shifting even within yourself from, I don't want to appear racist, to what racist ideas have I internalized, right? As a result of growing up in a country where systemic racism pervade, you know, pervades all aspects of, of society, right? All institutions. If we think about um, you know, all the major institutions in this country are controlled by white people who are then creating the policies and laws that govern us. So it's a really important place to start um, is that self-reflection piece. I think that's such an important point and it sort of connects back to something that you talked about in the very beginning of being able to engage in those those conversations, but also the idea that as we engage in them, that we're not shaming one another, that we're we're not immediately jumping to the idea that like, oh, that was a racist comment, 
um, or saying, oh, because you didn't do the thing that you really ought to have done, you're part of the problem too, that like that we're creating these space for conversation and that we're all here to acknowledge that we need to do better and we need to learn and we need to grow within ourselves and that we can challenge one another in a healthy way to really take that look inside, to do better and also to really gain the tools because I think as you accurately shared that you, you really have to develop that muscle for these conversations. It's not something that comes naturally, specifically to white people. I, I grew up in a very white town in the middle of the Midwest in the Kansas of all places. I and mean, we did not engage in these conversations. It was the farthest thing that we could have ever talked about. And so a lot of us are just for the first time starting to identify with these issues and to grapple with them and to learn how we talk about it and even learn how we address our friends and our family mm -hmm. to say, oh, what you've just engaged in is really not appropriate or like this is one of the problems with our community. So we're, we're learning and we're growing together and we want to create those safe spaces. Yeah, it's difficult. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's a great point, right? Um, the expectations we set for ourselves are important, right? So I think the expectation, especially for white people, needs to be these conversations are going to be messy, right? I'm going to mess up in these conversations. But if I'm really passionate and committed to doing my part, towards building a truly just society, I don't have any other choice, right? Because I think we're in this place where there is this different level of awakening for people um, that, that's very encouraging. But these conversations are gonna be difficult. They're going to be painful and uncomfortable. But I think it's also important to keep in mind, right, the level of discomfort um, that I'm going to feel as a white person is never going to come close to comparing to the pain for people of color of living these experiences on a daily basis. And so I think have, really developing that muscle is important. Um, and I think um, one of my best friends always says, and I love this, feedback is a gift. And so what sometimes happens is when people are giving us feedback, right, we don't like the way that it's delivered, right, or our shame button is going off. And so we're not, you know, then we don't want to hear it. So if you can think about feedback as being a gift, right, somebody's trying to tell you something, somebody's trying to educate you about something. And if you're seeing it as a gift, you're going to tend to be a little bit less defensive, even though it may be uncomfortable. Um, and so part of committing to this process of building that muscle is the idea that no matter how I get the feedback, I'm really going to try to take it, right? I'm really going to try to take it in. I'm going to try to thoughtfully process it. I'm going to think about, is there any aspect of this that is true? Right. Um, I think that that piece is is really important. And I, I think another important concept just to think about is this idea of intentions versus impact. So something really simple, it seems simple, but it's hard to do um, that white people can commit to is not having discussions about intentions. Right. So if a person of color brings to your attention, right, that they are offended by something that you said, that you're going to commit to not going into, oh, my gosh, that wasn't my intention. Right. It's really to try to seek to understand if you don't understand. Right. You can say, OK, tell me more about that. Right. Inviting the feedback. Um, and in, in Robin D'Angelo's book, White Fragility, she literally talks about right, eliciting feedback and then literally just saying, thank you, right? So we're not trying to defend or dismiss or explain. We're really talking about the impact, right? Because with, um, with microaggressions especially, right, a lot of times, what a white person might not even be aware that what they're saying is offensive, 
but it doesn't matter, right? If the impact of your behavior is that someone is hurt, in pain, offended, right? It then just becomes my responsibility to address the impact of what I did. So I think that piece is important also. Yeah, I think that is it's, it's incredibly important. I have, there are a couple of questions that have come in and I thought it, if it's okay with you, we could jump in with a couple of them. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Great. Um, so I know this is something that I certainly struggle with as well. Um, talking to our children about, and, and specifically parents, about race. And I hear this a lot. Um, you know, my backstory is that I obviously am a white woman, but my husband is black. I'm raising a black son, which is a totally interesting place to be right now and learning and growing and trying to do better. Um, but I also have a lot of friends who are white and who will say, oh, we don't raise our children to see race. We don't raise our children to see race. And I, well, as a white woman, I understand that. As I get that. That's how I thought I was raised as well. I also acknowledge that we're doing disservice to our children by not having these conversations. So I think the question, both for me and a couple of people um, in the chat boxes, is how do we start to address that with our, our friends, our white friends specifically? How do we bring that to light? How do we make sure that we're having these important conversations? And how do we um, speak specifically to our young kids about why seeing race is important and how that can be healthy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think that's something a lot of people are struggling with right now. Um, so I think in terms of talking to children, right, research tells us that children as young as preschool are really noticing differences in race. And so I think um, the way that we frame conversations is important. So um, if people are in this, again, if they're in that contact phase of, of white racial identity development and they're in the colorblindness, right, part of combating that is to really help people understand that colorblindness is a microaggression, right? So for anybody who, and I do think sometimes conversations can get heated. And so I think I encourage people to stay in conversations, but I also think that sometimes it can be helpful to suggest a reading to somebody, right? And say, why don't you check this out? And then let's have another discussion. Um, so Dr. Daryl Wing Sue has done a tremendous amount of work on microaggressions research. And so he breaks down microaggressions into eight categories in a way that I think is really helpful um, for white people seeking to understand and learn more about microaggressions. And so literally one of them is colorblindness, right? That notion, I don't see color. Um, everybody is just part of the human race, right? But recognizing that in doing that, you are dismissing someone's experience. You're, you're, you're dismissing the experience of people of color. And so needing to be able to talk about it, right? Because anti-racism is about this idea that, you know, we're, we're trying to really help people see that no racial group, right, is superior or inferior, but we do want to acknowledge that being a person of color in this country, right, the impact of racism. And that, so I think even with young children, it is important to start having conversations about how black and brown people are treated differently, right? They do have to deal with things that white people wouldn't ever think about having to deal with, right? I think about even when I was doing, um, you know, various groups at the challenge program, right? We were in Newark, so it was predominantly black and brown youth. And even thinking about the discussions that we had about how to navigate um, a teacher making racist comments, right? Or talking about if you're approached by a police officer, what do you need to do, right? And, and it's not, fair that those conversations need to happen, but they do. And so I think a huge part of working towards eradicating racism is for white people starting to see this as relevant to them, right? If we're trying to build a just society 
and really having these conversations with white children as well, right? People of color are already having these conversations. <laughs> it's really about white people committing. And, and again, helping children understand that these things aren't right and they're not fair, but also just creating a space, I think, to be able to tell children, you can ask me questions, right? That we're not going to shut down questions and comments about race. Um, and then as far as talking to other adults in our lives, right, I think um, that piece is important, right? Part of white privilege, right, part of using our white privilege is about speaking out and addressing things. Um, so if you are observing something, right, and it's uncomfortable to do this, really challenging and pushing yourself to try to speak up and say something. And I think you also have to know your audience, right? So I think it's often helpful to start out a conversation. Let's say I overhear something that I do perceive as racist. I'm going to start out, like Jen said, I'm not going to say to somebody, oh my gosh, that's so racist. You're ignorant, right? That's shaming. Nobody changes based on shaming them. Right. It, it's just it's not an effective strategy. Compassion is much more helpful. Right. And trying to seek understanding. So I'll always start out saying, can I give you some feedback? Right. And sometimes just asking that question lets the person it kind of prepares them. Right. OK. She's about to say something. I've never had somebody say no. When I've asked the question, would it be OK for me to give you some feedback? Right, and I'll say, this may be hard for you to hear. I know this is uncomfortable, um, but anybody that knows me, this is something I'm passionate about. So they may expect me to say something, but you know, for other people as well, really important um, to try to do it in a kind and compassionate way that we're trying to remove the shame. Um, and also knowing your audience in that there are some friends and family members that you may have that are just committed to the position they already have, right? So I think you also want to think about always trying, but once it's clear, this person is, has no interest, right? Um, they're just not going to be open, then it's better to invest your energy in people who are open to learning. I see a lot of heads nodding, so I am going to venture to say that we all have some family who are not interested in learning and growing and doing better. <laughs> yeah, um, I can, I, I can relate and uh, we'll just continue to stay the course and do the work where we, we can and uh, hope that people will come, come around. I wanna go back yeah. to the piece about parenting for a second because I think that is like one of the most difficult conversations that people are having right now. It, it's one thing to have a conversation with an adult but also really challenging to have it with kids. And one of the things that we've been really trying to do in our community and might be helpful to people on the call as well is framing this to our children in terms of protecting our friends, right? Mm -hmm. So white children need to see race because when you think about the antics that children get into, let's say toilet papering houses, which I was known for as a child, while yeah. it might be a, one experience for me and my white friends to go do that late at night at, you know, two o'clock in the morning, my friend who might be black or brown, it's putting them at a very serious risk and we need to be mindful of that. So really talking about acknowledging color, seeing people for differences, understanding that their experiences are going to be different, even though it's completely unfair and make sure that we're making choices that make sure all of our friends are protected and safe. Yes. And um, so I just share that to say like, it has been warmly received with our our friends and that's another strategy that we're using uh, in this very difficult world of parenting. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. And I think that that concept of, again, using privilege to talk about protection is so important, right? In terms of being able to show up and be present. Um, I think that is really important. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious if there's anybody who has questions, if you'd like to raise your hand. Um, there are a couple of people who have come in, um, but we'd love to hear. Did I see a hand? I'm scrolling through 200 people. So, uh, 
Good afternoon, uh, Jennifer. Hopefully you can see me. I don't know how to raise my hand. <laughs> um, so I'll just go ahead and just say a few words. Um, I first just want to take a moment to just thank you, Kristen, for having this dialogue. I think this is definitely a good time where people are open to having this conversation and kind of seeing how can they really be a part of the change. Right. Um, so I didn't get a chance to introduce myself earlier, but um, my name is Nkechi Akoli and I am the current president for the New Jersey chapter. So it's really exciting to see us move forward together um, with really trying to help everyone overall become more anti-racist. And what does that look like? Um, I think it was great that you were talking about, you know, impact versus intent. Right, and I think someone used recently uh, an analogy of if you stepped on my toe <laughs> and you said you didn't do it on purpose, it still hurt, <laughs> right? And so acknowledging the fact that um, even if it wasn't uh, intentional, it's still something that might impact somebody, right? And how do we move past that, right? Um, I think we've also talked a lot about how do we make sure that we're also not just going to our black friends just to, to ask all these questions um using those opportunities to have a dialogue but then also doing that um research and understanding on our own as well to help with that moving forward so i guess part of the question that i have for you is um i know a lot of people have been talking about being an ally and what does allyship look like, right? Um, maybe you can give a little bit of insight uh, to people on what does that look like and how can they really be an impact? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think um, being an ally really is about being committed to doing the anti-racist work. Um, and I, I, love um, Ibram Kendi's definition, right, of this idea that anti-racism, right, being an anti-racist, it's something that we're constantly working towards, right? So you don't become an anti-racist and then you've arrived and you stay there, right? This idea that it's this constant commitment. Um, so to me, being an ally is about using whatever privilege and power that you have, right, um, to advance the cause of racial justice. Um, and part of that is also about ongoing education, ongoing self-awareness, ongoing self-reflection, right? And at different points, it's also amplifying voices of people of color, right? And as an ally, I'm not taking the lead, right? Um, that it's really more about taking this approach of humility and really joining alongside um, to support the voices of people of color. Yeah. Thank you. We also have another question that came in uh, via private message. Um, someone is saying that they, they're hearing stay in conversation, don't be silent, but they're also hearing just say thank you and be quiet when you receive feedback. And it seems that staying curious is a way to stay engaged beyond thank you. Um, so if maybe you'd like to talk a little bit more about that, help um, people understand how you are feeling. Um, are, are those approaches that make sense? Um, you know, how do you stay in the conversation, remain a little bit silent, but also you know, look for more feedback and opportunities Okay. And whoever, if they have that, I've maybe not done it justice as well. So if that was your question, if you want to raise your hand too and come on and further explain it, that would be great. Okay. So it sounds like there was a little bit of, can, okay. Oh, there we go. No, I, I mean, I think you characterized it well. It was, it was just that, um, you know, yeah, it was, I was, seeming to hear both of those messages, right? Like stay in the conversation, stay in that uncomfortable space. But then I was also hearing, um, you know, when, when you receive feedback um, to kind of stay, stay more silent and, and say thank you. And I understand that, right? I mean, the idea is not to get defensive, mm -hmm. um, yeah. but, but I'm, I'm also realizing that if, you know, it, it, sometimes that feedback is rather short, right? And to really, you know, really understand what the, the effect of that impact was and how, you know, I can internalize that and, and change mm -hmm. it better, right? Mm -hmm. 
does it make sense to continue, you know, with some curiosity, right? Mm -hmm. Like, can you tell me a little bit more about right. how you're feeling, how, how that affected you, you know, so that I can get a fuller understanding. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, sometimes it's self-explanatory, right? Sometimes the feedback you get is like, okay, yeah, get it. Right. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. So I think, um, this idea, I think more of what I was referring to is um, the tendency of most white people to, to gaslight, to dismiss, to explain away, right, the concern that's being brought to them. So I guess what I'm saying is really trying to be intentional about doing less of that, right? So, but in terms of what you're saying, yes, that compassionate curiosity, absolutely. I don't want to have somebody say something to me and I don't really understand. And then I just say, thank you, right? It is about really making sure you do understand the impact um, on that person. So for sure, you want to be asking questions. But I think as white people, we just really want to be mindful about the ways that we can um, really, you know, exacerbate. If we think about just the courage it takes for a person of color, right, to address a white person, right, that takes a lot of courage to do that because you don't know what response you're going to get. And in fact, many times you're going mm -hmm. to be dismissed or somebody's going to get upset or somebody, if we think about in the news, right, when we think about all of the things that have been happening, right, where um, a white woman will call the police on someone, right, and then when the police show up, the white woman is now crying, right? So it, it, I think part of what mm -hmm. I want people to take is you really want to center the conversation on the person of color and not make it about me, right? Um, and so the, the thank you piece is really instead of, of trying to explain away, well, but this is what I meant, that ultimately just dismisses the experience of a person of color. Um, you know, so it's kind of like, I've taken the feedback, now I'm gonna try to use it, right? And, and thank you is an experience that, that a person of color is not going to receive a lot. Um, and oftentimes my experience in, in ongoing conversations with people of color is that they often feel worse after they do bring something up, which is why sometimes they're just walking around carrying these things, right, on a daily basis, um, because it would make sense given the history of this country that they don't feel safe, right, addressing mm -hmm. certain things. Does that clarify? I wanna make sure I answer the question. Yes. Yeah. Okay, all right, thanks. Another question that came in um, from Kate in the chat box. Um, can you explain more in detail what it means to amplify, amplify voices of people of color? That we see this a lot on social media, um, people reposting it um, as an example, and not really sure what amplify means. And what are we, what does that mean today? Yeah, absolutely. So again, if as white people, if we really are seeking to understand, right, the impact of racism, um, who better to hear it from than the people who are living it on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So part of that is about listening, right, and letting, um, letting people of color take the lead in terms of what they think are helpful solutions, right? At a lot of tables right now, it's predominantly white people, right? If, you, if we go up the chain in any organization, it's gonna be predominantly white, right? And so part of amplifying voices is that idea that we need to hear less from white people, right? And more from people of color. And that again, I think people are saying this a lot on social media, right? that there are specific black voices that part of using your white privilege is highlighting those people, right? Like, hey, why don't you read this person's work? Or let me highlight this black business so we can support this, right? That as a white person, we want to be amplifying um, or highlighting those 
things in terms of, again, using privilege to address those issues. Thank you for that. Um, someone shared privately that sometimes that can feel a little uh, confusing as well, because not only are we being challenged to amplify voices, but also don't want to put the burden on black and brown individuals to solve the problem. So sometimes that can feel uh, a little conflicting and I see some heads nodding. So uh, I'm going to say that there are people here who feel that, so you're not alone. Um, and any thoughts you have on finding that balance or learning more about what we're being charged with these days? So, sorry, can you just, can you just read the question one more time? More what a comment. Comment. Um, that um, we see a lot of the, the need to amplify the voices right. of people of color, but also right. at the same time um, being, there, there's an understanding that we don't want to put the pressure on the people of color to solve a problem that they didn't create. So right. okay. wanting to amplify, but also feeling like we have an obligation to step up and lead and dismantle this because it's not something that black individuals created. Um, so right. feeling conflicted in that message and what their role is. Okay. So yes, and I guess I, I do see those as, as two separate things, right? So the amplifying voices is really about promoting, right? Um, the experiences of people of color, their ideas, right? Their ideas about how to most effectively address issues, whether that's in their community or on a, a, a national level. Um, like we've seen people like Brene Brown, right, on her Instagram. She featured um, numerous um, women of color, right? Um, just because the, these are voices that may not even be known, right? But in terms of white people looking to black people or people of color period to educate them, right? That piece is, is not okay. Um, my experience, again, in, in talking with people of color is, and I would never attempt to speak for people of color, but they're exhausted, right? They're exhausted from these ongoing conversations that now as, as some white people are having this awakening, which is fantastic, right? It's let me go ask this person of color, right? And I think while again, probably with good intentions, right? That idea, people of color often feel like white people are looking to them to be the spokesperson or mouthpiece for their whole group, right? So that's negating the idea that there's a lot of diversity, right? Again, race is a social construct, but there's, there's diversity, a lot of diversity within races and ethnicities, right? So um, the education piece really does fall on us. And, and I guess I would also encourage people to think about developing, um, you know, when possible, being intentional about developing authentic relationships, mm -hmm. right? Because inevitably, when, if you have authentic cross-racial relationships, right? And I remember my my supervisor telling me this, you know, she said, if you have a cross-racial friendship where you're not talking about race, it's not authentic, right? Because it's going to inevitably come up in authentic relationships because again, we're saying race is relevant. People's racial experiences are relevant. Um, so I think part of it is, again, we still live in a very segregated society, even though it's diverse. And so most white people probably don't have authentic cross-racial friendships um, or relationships. So that's something to think about too. I know in certain towns, right, there might be um, mom groups, right? And it's like a diver it's, it's people who are committed to, hey, let's develop these relationships um, where we are getting to know and care about each other on a different level. Mm -hmm. um, could I add something too? I, I think you, you, made some, <laughs> you made some really, really great points. And I think to your point, um, you know, I, I've been black my whole life. <laughs> um, and a lot of other people when having these conversations um, recently have said, you know, um, 
we've lived this our whole lives, right? And so to now become that whole sole educator for our friends can get really exhausting or become something that becomes a different type of burden, right? Um, and so I think there are definitely many people who would be willing to have those conversations, especially if it's authentic, right? Um, but then also as people start to do their own work in that process, I think people become more willing to have that dialogue. So it's not like, oh, this is something you could have just researched, right? Right. Um, right. But with that being said, I think even um, as we start talking about amplifying uh, voices, I think you made a really, really good point. Um, but when I was talking to some uh, social workers recently as well, one of the things that they were talking about is even amplifying their voices in, let's say, um, a staff meeting, right? Mm -hmm. There's been many times where uh, someone of color may have said something uh, and then mm -hmm. someone else may have said it a different way and they get the attention or the credit for that conversation, mm -hmm. right? So it's like really being uh, conscious of helping support those other people's voices in that room um, by kind of bring that to the light as well in different ways, you know? Again, <laughs> you know, it depends on the conversation, but of course helping, you know, show that they do have something of value or we have something of value to contribute to the conversation, so. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Hi, Jennifer, this is Nicole. I don't know if you guys can hear me or see me, but I just wanted to piggyback off of Nikishi's comment. Um, I'm a black woman, I know my picture's not up there, but I work on Wall Street. A lot of the microaggressions that I, that I receive is that when I do a presentation, they say, oh, you speak very well. And it's not really a compliment because to me, I automatically assume that you don't think that I'm articulate because of the color of my skin. So that's another microaggression that a lot of my colleagues that are people of color experience. Um, so now what I started doing is putting it back on them and saying, well, what exactly do you mean by that? Because that makes the person have to then explain what they said to me when they said, oh, you speak very well. Because to me, I'm assuming you think I'm not articulate because I'm a person of color. Mm -hmm. Adding that point as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, unfortunately, that is a very common aggression, microaggression, right, that people of color, especially in professional roles, professional leadership roles, do experience. Um, so I'm glad that you're asking those questions, right, and putting it back on the person. Um, and hopefully they can do some self-reflection. Thank you so much for sharing. And I'm so glad that you joined us from Wall Street. It's good to have a diversity in our, in our conversations. It's really wonderful. I do want to be mindful of time. I know we have a couple of people who have additional questions, um, but we are wrapping up at two minutes and um, want to be respectful. I know people are on their lunch breaks, et cetera. Um, so it, it sounds like this is the first of many conversations that are needed. There's a lot of work to be done in this space and people are hungry for more learning and more opportunities and spaces to have conversations that feel safe. So I appreciate that you've created that here today. I'm wondering if there are any just final resources you'd like to share with uh, the group before we part ways today with the note that um, we will continue to create um, more yeah. programs and opportunities like this. And as everyone here knows, we have um, a great series, our race, responsibility and reconciliation, and um, we will continue to have these dialogues. So. Um, What's gonna hold us over? Where should we be learning? What should we be reading? Yeah, so I think the NASW New Jersey page is fantastic, right? There's literally tabs for take action and get educated. So I think um, all of the resources on the website are fantastic. Um, I would encourage people, if you didn't participate in the book club last month, right, there's another one this month, um, Austin Channing Brown's book. Um, so definitely reading. And I think that taking action is also really important, right? There are, there are a variety of ways, right? Ibram Kendi's book is fantastic too, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And I love that he focuses on policy. Right, so he's not necessarily focused on changing people's hearts. It's really about, we need policy change. And so there are really simple things that you can do. You can sign up to get emails from organizations like ACLU, NAACP, Color of Change, where they literally will give you the body of the email you just put in your name, your email address, and you can sign petitions. They will literally, it generates emails to your local representatives. 
Um, so I think that's something we can all do from home. It is not time consuming at all and it matters. Um, obviously voting in the November election is really important um, for sure. Um, and then um, again, just committing to doing that ongoing self-reflection, self-awareness. And then um, at our group practice, um, if you go to our website, mosaiccounselingnewjersey.com, um, we do offer a variety of trainings. So if people want ongoing trainings or workshops, um, we can definitely do that. We're in the process of creating um, a couple of them in webinar format. So somebody could just watch it online. Um, and we are in the process also of starting a couple groups. So one is going to be a group specifically for white people who are interested in and committed to the anti-racism work. Um, and then we're going to have a group run by a black therapist on staff who that group is going to be specifically for people of color, really providing a safe space to be able to talk about and process and provide support to each other. Um, so I think those are also important things to do just in terms of people's ongoing, um, ongoing process as we continue, again, to do what each of us can individually. Great, thank you, Kristen. I appreciate everyone uh, leaning into the conversation today. And I will just share, there are a couple of things you can also do um, that you didn't mention. One is taking action that's really important, not only voting in the next, what, 97 days, something like that. Um, but right now, NASW New Jersey, along with other chapters of NASW throughout the country, are engaged in a two-day call to action. There are resources on our website. You can join thousands of people this afternoon by calling your local legislators. We have information and tips on how to have the phone calls, calling for police reform, calling um, for local, state, and federal action. So if you go to our website, naswnj.org, and then click call to action, you can download those resources. And um, I think that's an important thing to do um, just as part of this conversation, and certainly as we look to change the systems um, and address systemic uh, discrimination. Um, we will continue to have more of these conversations. For those of you who have loved it, thank you for joining us. You will be able to share it. It's live on our Facebook page. So if you want to share it on social media, just go to N NASWNJ's Facebook page and you can share it immediately. Um, but if you're more patient, um, probably later this afternoon, it will be posted on our website as well um, on our Race Responsibility and Reconciliation page. Um, so you can share it uh, via YouTube and the, the link will be there as well. Thank you all for joining us today. These are great conversations and uh, one of my favorite things to do with a community of like-minded, committed individuals. And we're here to grow and learn together and I look forward to the continued conversation. Thank you all so much. Thank you all, we appreciate it.